Good evening, everyone. Can all of you hear me? Yes. Oh, okay, good. I have to say, I'll start from the beginning, just before the war started. We were children. I was eight years, nine years old, and we were told in school we have to prepare because Germany will drop into the Netherlands and try to get to Rotterdam to go to England. So we were sort of prepared that the war would come, but we didn't comprehend really what it meant. But the Dutch uh, army was building up, and then the time came, May the 10th, 1940, after Germany had gone into Poland and Austria and in all the different countries, uh, we, it was our turn. But because the older people had learned what was missing during the First World War, anything that was export, rubber, coffee, tea, oil, soap. So every one of them had bought it already into the homes in case of the war. So I made a tent, we woke up with a tremendous noise, and uh, my father came upstairs and he said, everyone into the cellar. We were thinking, oh, it's a strange uh, thunderstorm or something. Now, we had a big family, a family of 10. Eight girls and later on two boys. <laughs> they had to have that boys. <laughs> anyway, the, my brothers and, and, and another little sister was below me. I mean, I was a little older than they were. But anyway, we were so dumb, some of us, to go outside to see what was going on, not knowing really what warfare was. But that was the time that Germany dropped into the Netherlands. Holland and the Netherlands is the same thing. You know, it's two boards for the same country. And so the first thing that happened was they picked up all the Dutch scientists, the Germans, they picked all the Dutch scientists. And then they started to empty the warehouses, and they emptied the stores. And it went on and on and on. And then we knew that we really were going to have a bad time, a real bad time. After the first year, they started closing the schools, and the schools were used for warfare. And the parents had a big problem, what to do with the kids, you know? was difficult, especially the little boys, they would love to hang around warfare stuff. It was dangerous too. And it became far worse. And then we saw that they were trying to pick up Jewish people. And all Jewish people had to wear a big star, and the Star of David, a big yellow star, so that everybody could identify them as Jewish people. Well, it started with that, and then it got worse and worse. Then the Jewish stores had to be closed. And the funny part of it was, <clears throat> every time they closed a store or somebody's house, because they put them in concentration camp, they came and they were looting the whole place in no time. They, they really it had to do with loot, looting. This whole thing about the Jewish people it had to be but taken away what they had because the German Reich could use it. And a lot of people feel that that has a lot to do with that anti-Jewish sentiment that went on. People being brainwashed. And so that's what happened to them. And then when I couldn't go to school, I was 14 years old at the time. And my father was a journalist. And he said, you know, it's a good time for you to write everything down that's happening for the sake of history. One day you look back and then you see what all you wrote down. And at first I didn't take it too serious and then I thought, well, I do. So I started doing this. But the point was that if they found out that you were anti-German, your parents would go to a concentration camp, or someone got shot, really. It was that rough. And, um, but anyway, I did. I started to write a book. So my book, that book there, is my diary from 
14 to 18 years old. When the war was finished, I stopped with that diary. And um, it is uh, 60, more than 60 years, I never opened it up. I met my sister married a Canadian in the wartime, and after the war she went to Montreal and married him. Then I came to visit my sister in Montreal, and at that time, that was 1952, it was easy if you came as a visitor, you could stay and take a job without a visa at the time, it was easy. Well, I started working at Canadian Aviation Electronics in Montreal, I lived in Montreal, and after a while, Howard Hughes sent three of his engineers to Montreal, Canada for some of the products and some of the teaching of his products. One of them was my future husband. Mm -hmm. Well, he became my boss. So we saw each other on a daily basis. And his name was Wyckoff, which happened to be an old Dutch name from the 1600s. <laughs> <laughs> and I had to learn all about the Wyckoffs. But one of the very first people to settle in New York, New Amsterdam at the time. So it was interesting to me. And, and so we had, we had a very good relationship and then we married. We had two children in Montreal. And then Hughes called them back to California and had two more kids in California. So, but I always joke about it because I used to say, well, I used to work for him, and now he works for me. <laughs> but then Hughes hired me again, because they needed an, an, um, an international office in Ottawa, Canada. So we were both together, my husband and I. We were sent to, to Canada, and we lived there for another 16 years for, for the Hughes office. So, um, to go back now, you know a little bit about, I had two boys and two girls. So now you know a little bit about what happened. But I have to go back to where I was. So, when the last year of the war was really, really bad, my sister, one of them, was in the resistance. And some of her friends were shot. What they did was every time an Allied plane would fall, and that happened all the time, because the city, Nijmegen, where I'm from, is right at the border of Germany. And so the Germans did everything possible to shoot the planes down above the Netherlands so that the bombs would go to Germany. But every night, every, every night, they would come over, sometimes in the daytime too, but mostly at night. And every night we would sit up every, with air raids, you know, we could, you had to sit in the cellar, and the cellar was very small. It was good for vegetables and stuff. Sauerkraut, my mother had in the <laughs> But then I had a brother with the long legs, and every time we had to be in that cellar, we were like, you know, like, like sardines in a can, you know, <laughs> all alive. There was a little faucet, and my brother with his long legs would always hit that faucet, and the faucet would start leaking. It was a mess. <laughs> and another time, we had a huge grenade. We had a little window in that, in that cellar, and the grenade fell just in front of that little window. And somehow we were saved. And then we found out that a whole lot of these people that were forced to work in the slave labor camps in Germany, from Poland, from all the different countries, that they made Dutch. And those, those people, I, I wish that somebody would have thanked them once, or that somebody would have known who those heroes were, because they were shot, I'm sure, if they were found out. So there were, the, the further the work went on, the more Dutch we got. So there was all these people that, you know, that endangered their own life to save us. I mentioned them in the back of the book because I've never heard anyone thank them. 
that I, I, I've I always felt nobody knows them, you know. So they, they have an honor place. But anyway, on the, 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 the Jewish people, I was brought up a Catholic. And I went to Catholic schools, and, and then the high school I couldn't finish, the nuns in the cloister would teach us. And also in the cloister were little children, little Jewish children. The nuns were hiding the little kids because some of these people had stand on the trains to be put into Germany, into, the, into this concentration camp. They would give away the babies. It was awfully sad. They, and then they would take them. And the only place to really hide them was at the farms or in cloisters because they would not allow to go inside the cloister. These, not that they always listened, these German soldiers, but, they were, but that was a good place for them. The only thing is they were brought up with Dutch names and they were adopted by families that they that never even knew they were Jewish. Nobody could talk. You know, you, you didn't want to be caught. So uh, later on, the, after the war was finished, so many years later, uh, the Jewish people wanted these children back. But it was such a drama because these kids grew up as Dutch kids and, and they were attached to these people they grew up with. And it was very sad for them to have to leave to go to Israel. I know that was a sad part of the war. And um, also at the last year, we got more and more strikes, strikes, strikes. So then it came, you want to strike, you get the bullet. It became that bad. And then I was in, in this office called Smith Transformer Office, the, the worldwide today. And I had to do the telephone so every time we got an air aid alarm, there was a bomb shelter down below in the big plant, and about three, four hundred people could go in there. But a lot of people didn't feel safe because plants were being bombed all the time. And it, but I would do this phone there, and I felt kind of proud of myself. It was, or 17, you know, I said, ooh, this is an important job because it was the only communication with the outside world, you know, and nobody could go anywhere, you couldn't be on the streets. But, and then when the air raid would blow, that the planes were gone, then the people could be there back to what they were doing. But there was one time it was February the 22nd, 1944. The Allied planes came over and they happened to be American planes at the time. They went into Germany to bomb. They made a mistake, come back over to where we were, Nijmegen, but they had passed on the way into Germany. They came back and dropped all these bombs on that city. And within four minutes, we had thousands of people dead. It was really bad. And then the Germans made a great big propaganda. Look what your friends, what you get from your friends, you know. And then other people would have posters and said, well, if it wasn't for you, this would not have happened. But that was a huge mistake. So when the time came of the liberation, we had General Gavin. He was the youngest American general at the time. He was only 26. And they gave him the job to come to drop into Naomi, but the town is right on the border of what you call the Schwarzwald, which is a German huge woods between my hometown and, and the German. So he fell with his parachutes in the middle of a potato field. His, his, his um, plans that they were given to him were not all that correct. And so we see in our street 17 Americans. Now three doors away from us were 300 German soldiers. 
So my father and the neighbor went over to these Germans that hey, the war is over. They're here. They're all here. The Allied troops are here, they're here. And uh, so they went looking to give themselves up. <laughs> and they had this white handkerchief on. Okay. Is it okay? Yeah. He, they had this white handkerchiefs on the bayonets. And they started marching and marching, but couldn't find anyone to give themselves up to. <laughs> we had to take these 17 parachutists and hide them in the homes, you know. They had no idea where they were, they had no idea. And anyway, that was all, all got worse and worse and worse by the day. More Germans started killing a lot of people. There were trainfuls of people shot that night in these next three days. It was horrible. We couldn't get there. You could not. You could not get through there. It was near a train depot. Horrible. But well, there were people, prisoners, that were going into Germany. They didn't want them there anymore. <coughs> so they just shot them. They just shot them. There were some horrible situations. When, but when I started reading this book, it took me all those years never to look at that book. I didn't want to read it because I didn't want to go through the pain and through a lot of misery and to remember of a lot of hatred. Because, you know, you build up a big hatred against that German Reich. Now, I have to say here that the older Germans, there was a lot of those, never made it through the war because they were shot by Hitler. Hitler shot a lot of his own people, his own German people, but a lot of them are shot. Maybe a lot of people don't know this, but this is true. People that were against him, socialists, communists, whatever they were, and they didn't fit into the system. And if you spoke against the system, you've had it. You know, you're you shot. So, I have to set that straight. I have to set the point where the people were so brainwashed. The children were brainwashed. They were so brainwashed, they followed him. And especially the women of Germany. The women followed Hitler more than the men because the women didn't have to go to the front. They didn't have to fight. A lot of the German guys had to fight, but the women didn't have to fight. And they were more, much more Hitler friendly than the men. But also, this, the story goes from the German side, they never knew about the concentration camps. Now, that is the biggest nonsense. We had them in the Netherlands, they put them in, 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 in Holland, they had them all over Germany. We all knew about the concentration camp. It's in, in the diary. We knew all of them. And yet, so many of the people denied that they ever knew about concentration camps. Well, to come back to General Gavin, when the liberation came, the total liberation, the total American army came, and uh, when they saw the devastation that happened with that mistake bombardment in, in Nijmegen, Gavin decided to set up an organization. He was, he was from Albany, New York. And that those people from Albany adopted my hometown as a sister city. So we got clothes and shoes and you know, like you do here when, when the hurricane comes, you help, you know. So they did that. Some money, they, they rebuilt part of the universities. They did more on, 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 on some hospitals. They really, really tried to help, which they did. I have to give them a lot of credit for this. And the daughter of General Gavin became a good friend of mine. She'd heard about the book, and she wrote me that she also had written a book about her father. And so we exchanged that, and then we became good friends. But um, to, to, to go back, when we saw the first American troops coming in, we were euphoric. The, 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 the was, after five years of war, to see the, those people, these people come to free us, 
we were so unbelievable grateful and we all said come to a house you know come to a house <clears throat> but there were people who couldn't speak a word of english and so the, the, they developed some kind of a slang uh, exchange that sort of fitted into sentences like uh, soap for the baby uh, cigar for papa i mean you had these little sentences and that people could could sort of communicate with each other. So at the time that they all came, we were evacuated because we had gotten a huge bomb on the back of our home, which the wolf went into the air and came down crooked. <laughs> so every time it rained, we had to put umbrellas in the bed and somebody would kick the umbrella and the whole mattress was wet and it was a mess, you know. <laughs> but at the same time, you could not complain because everybody went through the war. And somebody had a war, somebody lost whole families. And in, in the morning after the bombings, you wonder if your friends were still alive. And a lot of my friends never made it. We had this, this group of kids that formed a ping pong club. And in the ping pong club, we were teenagers. The first thing the boys did, they swore a blue streak that they couldn't do at home. You know, they <laughs> acted really big. And, <clears throat> okay, let's dream up something really good to kill these SOBs, you know what I mean? <laughs> a really foul language, they never spoke at home. It was an outlet. The, but when you're young, you still want to live. And you still want to do things that young people do. And my big problem was, when the war started, I was as flat as a pancake. <laughs> and there were no bras. And Hitler did not allow bras. That is a weird one. <laughs> it is really weird because <laughs> it costs money and time and labor to do this, so it was not enough. So I would look in my mother's big old linen closet to see if there was something left for my older sisters, you know. There were six older sisters. But they had to start taking their own stuff out, their old stuff. So I had this girlfriend who had a mother who had some old cotton left cotton, ball of cotton. And so she knit it, but she became to look like this. <laughs> but these are just these crazy things that happen. You, know? you have to talk about real things too, because if you talk all the time about the bombs and the pain, you know, you have to say also the real things that happen. And like my girlfriend, they had two <coughs> Americans coming to the house and anyone that had a roof left over the home was asked to put them inside because all these thousands of them that were sleeping on the streets and all. So anyone that had a house left, most of them had no windows because that went on for five years. We had these bombings. But anyway, my, my girlfriend, Corey, had these two fathers come in asking if there was room. They didn't understand the word. And one had to go to the bathroom <clears throat> really bad. Now, so they asked him, what is it you want? What is it you want? And then he said, toilet. Toilet? A toilet is a toilet. But in, in, in Holland, you go to, you make toilet also, if you use the French word, you make, put makeup on yourself. <laughs> So they thought, oh my God, he wants to wash up. So they bring this great big pail and put it on the dining room table and gave him a, 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 a towel. <laughs> and this is really true. They thought perfect, a perverts. I'm sure that's what they must have thought. It's going to be I had no idea what they had to do. And then finally, one of them made some kind of a gesture, you know, <laughs> and then they finally got it. But, <laughs> but these are the real things that happen, and, and, and you know, these are the real things that happen. But this is a takeaway from all the pain, because we lost my kid sister, she was four years old, just two weeks before the war was finished. 
she was hit by a truck, a German truck, and and we lost her for. So it's it, but we were just one of many, you know, and people were so kind. Nobody talked about a religion. Nobody talked about this or that. Nobody was rich or poor. They were all the same. All the same for the same thing. You had to fight the enemy. You had to find and share your food. When you had, when you had food that day, you, you had to share it even though tomorrow you wouldn't have it. And I had to go with an old bicycle. But we had to make from tiles, old tiles, we made strips. And from these strips, we put them around like a, like, you know, like, like a rubber tie, or I don't know what to call it. <laughs> but it wouldn't last long because if it was warm outside, that rubber would melt and that tire would come off. So I had to go there to go to the, to the farmers to bag for food. We had to bag for food because in the city there was no food coming in at all. And that went on for years and years and years. Thousands and thousands of people have died from hunger. Thousands of them. And um, so you had to go to the farmers. So I hated the farmers as much as I hated the Germans. <laughs> because, you know, you, you had to go so far and you had to stop to fix the bicycle all the time, that rubber thing, and then bag, you know, had the bag. And if it was the farmer himself, the farmer would give something, apples, piece of bread, whatever. But then the women would come, the, his wife would come and check, you know, got too much. And money was no good. The money had no value. So you had to trade for rings. For, my mother had to trade all her linens, all her antiques for pieces of bread, and sometimes for a piece of bacon because there was no oil or butter or anything. So the bacon helped to do something. And um, I had this necklace given by my grandmother. It was an old fashioned necklace with big garnets. But I felt good because she picked me out of the gang of kids to give me that, that necklace. I was very proud of that necklace. Well, then this farmer woman comes to my mother's house with her daughter, and the daughter sees the necklace, and she said, I want that necklace. And um, my mother looked at me, you know, I could see she looked at me in turn, or what was I going to do? I needed food, and she has that necklace. So I thought, well, I have to do something here. So the woman, the farmer's wife said, you can have a loaf of bread, a small loaf of bread for the necklace. I said, no way, you're not carrying my necklace, it's for my grandmother. Well, then that girl started crying, I want that necklace. So then I thought, well, you're going to pay. So I said, three loaves of bread. And then my, no, my mother really wanted that bread for the big family, you know, for the neighbor and all. And so I told her, so I gave her the necklace and I said, wait. Yeah, when she went to the Huda Hall, to the door to leave, I said, hey, wait a minute. After the war is finished, I come personally and rub the necklace off your neck. <laughs> I personally will come and get you after the war is finished. <laughs> so it never happened. <laughs> but I felt so bad because my grandmother had given that, you know. So, I mean, these are the things that uh, in that book too, I mean, every day I had to write down the horrible things and that's why for years I didn't look at the book, as I said before. But the, when the Allied troops came and we were so very happy, they had not, they really did not understand, couldn't understand how happy we were with them. So they thought we were awful happy people to always, you know, no, we were just from all the suffering. <laughs> we saw an end to the suffering and we were so grateful that they were there. Now, as time went on, that city I came from became very left because of the university and all. So, 
left. And there was more and more talk that the Canadians, they had also come to the Netherlands, but more like occupying troops, you know, the work, the war, the, the real work was done. And they there, they were the two, but the people were getting the impression that it was only the Canadians that had liberated my hometown. So one I published, it was also published in the Netherlands, this book. And I was there and there was a lot of nice words said in the Queen and all that thing. But anyway, when they found out the truth, that it was this 82nd Airborne people. Uh, these are, I love these guys. I will always love them. And I dedicated the book to them because they were our first liberators. And so what they did was, um, they had the book and uh, they invited us to come to Fort Bragg. <laughs> and they had three days, a whole uh, reenactment of the war in my hometown. It turned out to be the worst part of um, Market Garden. You know, that was the name of the war theater, Market Garden. So yeah, it was very nice. They let me there and it was so, so wonderful. Three days of them and I had to speak and talk to the boys and have to put at least, um, maybe, is it, is it there that thing? Oh, see, it's over there. And I laid, you know, on the on the people that died in my hometown, I put a wreath on there, and it was very, very nice. And I kept repeat invitations. But I have to say, and and by the way, I'm an American citizen by choice. <laughs> I like to add that to it. <laughs> people ask, you know. What are you? But I wanted to vote at one time and then I became an American citizen. I lived in Manhattan Beach, California at the time. But yes, I am. And I am probably, you know, just, I don't want to hurt anybody's feelings, but I think sometimes that I'm a better American than many Americans. Does that, it sounds bragging or whatever, but I really mean it because I have seen what they've done and I know they're fighting right now in other places, and I hope these people feel as grateful as the Dutch were. That these, you know, there's people that lose them, there's families, there's children, that they're being missed by so many people behind mm -hmm. them. There's a whole family sometimes that suffers if they don't come home. So really, I, to me, the 82nd, these are my heroes. They really are my heroes, and I wish that every young people, all the young people, could understand just a little bit how it feels when you are under the under a horrible, horrible regime for five years, a most hateful, evil regime, and then you finally see your liberators come. That is so fantastic. You, you, you look at them like angels coming down, you know? And I'm sure they're not angels. But you, you get all this, you know? You, you, but, and then also you get a lot of contacts. And, uh, and many, when I was speaking about my book in the Netherlands too, there's still today many contacts that continued where the parents knew someone from here or somebody had died over there and they would keep up the grave and all. And there was still an awful lot of contacts between the two countries. But what has happened to my hometown is really great because now it is a real American city. And I, I take a little bit of credit for that. <laughs> I sometimes have to give yourself a little credit. <laughs> so, yeah, I do because um, the, the younger people, because we're different generations now, the younger people really, they've heard the story from the mother or the grandmother or the family, but never really, really heard it the way it should be. So I think now it's really fantastic, because now it is, of course, tourism help too. It's, it's the oldest city in the Netherlands 
It's a very old, old city. It's a beautiful city. I'm not preaching for you guys to go there, but I mean, <laughs> it is a beautiful city. And uh, I'm very happy that uh, you see the American flag. You see an awful lot of um, adages in it, in it, from English into Dutch. Sometimes it doesn't make much sense because they have a thing like that's the way the ball bounces. They have to put that into Dutch, and it doesn't sound as good. As it <laughs> but anyway, it is a great grateful city now <coughs> and all these old things that they have done come back and uh, this is what I like about the um, the 82nd they have all this in the, the whole history of Nijmegen they have a big piece of land that they call Nijmegen and the reenactment is done exactly the same as it happened when they were in my hometown I had to cross this white river the wall because a, a place too far which is called Arnhem where the, the English were losing the battle against the, the British the British were losing the battle against the, the Germans at the time the British were winning and they needed help and so this 82nd and the engineers I think it's a three or seven engineers they all had to go through Nijmegen to rescue these people from, you know, that book, uh, A Bridge Too Far. Mm -hmm. That is that place where they had to go from my home to there. There was 18 kilometers and there were nothing, nothing but Germans just waiting for them to come in with all the materials. That was about the last camp of the German army. So the fighting was ferocious, really bad because they were so close to their own country. And like I said before, as long as they could fight on other ones, in other ones country, they wouldn't have all the damage as much. And then we got Patton coming up, who uh, was a daredevil in our opinion. He may have lost people, <coughs> but if he saw that the Russians were coming so fast to Berlin, all of a sudden there was a rush who would come to Berlin. So Patton made up his mind he couldn't listen too much to the politicians. So he, he made his own mind up and thought, I have to go to save the war. So he, this is seen from the outside end, you know, from our side of the water. He saw what Patton was doing. He had to rush like crazy, so he came to Berlin and at, at the right time, but it took lives, of course. But that, that he also saved the war. So that is another one that is, in my opinion, in him. Mm -hmm. <laughs> Are you uh, open for any questions? Go <coughs> yeah, uh, if you have any questions, <coughs> I should ask you. Any questions you have? The Germans, when they entered your country, and your city, they would hunt out the Dutch scientists. Did they want to use their brains to make weapons in Germany? Did they force them to be prisoners and do scientific work in Germany? Or did they just take them away to concentration camps and kill them? No, scientists? no, they didn't go to concentration camp. What they did was, they did in all these countries they occupied. They knew before, five years before the war started, we all knew that Hitler was preparing. For five years he was preparing. And he had lists of scientists and they were all put to work, forced working in labs somewhere in Germany. He used the brains or they, they didn't come back. We never saw him come back. So I don't think they lived through it. And so it was, it, it was they knew who was head of companies, they knew an awful lot of information about everyone. Uh, anyone of importance to them, they knew exactly who to pick up. They were all picked up at the beginning of the war. But we also had this, we, we knew a little bit. The, the German woman that wanted to be maids, they would, Germany had a horrible depression time, horrible depression. 
And what happened is the German Kaiser left to live in the Netherlands, and he left his people somewhat behind, and they didn't have a leader. So then Hitler came up, and Hitler became the leader. So that's how it all started, that Hitler thing. But um, what they did was they sent maids, and you could, for very little money in Holland, you could get a German maid to work for you. Then we found out that they worked only for military. They worked for diplomats and they worked for the military. So all these maids were already trained spies. This is five years before the war when it started. So really it was a five year plan. And and so therefore they knew how to pick up and pick up the people in in, in jobs uh, special specialism. They were all gone. And we have never heard from them since. All we knew is that they were to go taken to Berlin. That was sad for the people. Anyone else? <laughs> yes, My mom used to talk about how much she admired the Dutch and what they went through in the war, because she was born in the 20s. And she told the stories when we were kids about how they had to eat the tulips. Yes. And I, I was not sure if I believed her or not. Yes, it's true. I ate them. So she said you, you would dig them up and boil them? or I... Yes, you know, they taste a bit like onions. <laughs> but there was nothing else. Some of us ate grass. You had to do something, you know. But you were always hungry. And that's what she said, that she heard that, and I thought, yeah, well, no, that's yeah, absolutely kid. true. Okay. Well, yeah. I figured, but you know, you're a kid, you don't really believe what your mom's telling you. No, no, <laughs> but it is, it's, it's true, it's true. I ate them too. It's, like I said, it's a bit like an onion. But if there was nothing else, you just, you, you, you can drink a lot of water, and your stomach gets so hungry, and you drink water a lot. But it, it's, it's, you have to have something. So you eat weird so, stuff. <laughs> she used to talk about how tough and how much she admired them for that what they went through and I thought well that was nice yeah can you, oh. tell, can you tell about the title of the book and why you called it dancing in long challenges oh okay <laughs> one second please um the book dancing in bomb shelters as I mentioned, I did the telephone answering service down in the basement of the bomb shelter. It was a big bomb shelter. And there was a fellow was, in my opinion, so handsome. <laughs> I mean, the most handsome man on earth, in my opinion, at the time. <laughs> and he was a little older than I was. And then he said to me, you know, when it's all over and, and they blow the horn, that the, 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 the planes are gone, Let's have a dance, you know. I said, okay. So <coughs> we waited, and he had this old little, uh, what do you call it? Yeah, a he called it a gramophone. It was a record player. Yeah, it was a record player. Mm -hmm. And he had only one record, and <laughs> that was from the uh, Andrews sisters, I think it already were. Oh, cool. <laughs> and uh, what was the name of oh, yeah. Blue Moon. That's oh. the Blue Moon. <laughs> So we would dance on the cement <coughs> floor. You know, this is just a cement floor. We would dance, wait till all these people are gone out of the bombshell, and we would dance. And he then, then he whispered all these nice things in my ear, and sweet nothings, you know. <laughs> <laughs> and he would say, let's pretend we're on some tropical isle somewhere. And we have all, and we're so much in love and all that stuff. And said all these nice things. And, until the noise of the bomb drops. <laughs> and all of a sudden you're out of it again, you know, you're totally back to the noise. But, you know, so that is where the title comes from. We did dance uh, And uh, what was very nice, that company, that same company <coughs> invited me to come over to the Netherlands because the book is mentioned many times and they paid for the whole trip and everything else, and they were a hundred year in that business, and the queen was there and all that stuff. And then they they thanked me and they took me back into that bomb. basement of the bomb shelter. It's still there. It's an archive now, but it's, and they and they played. Blue they had the girls too. <laughs> and they played the blue moon song. Yes, and 
the blue moon, they played the blue moon. Oh. <laughs> it was very interesting, yeah. <coughs> but these are my daughters. Oh. They were with me. Yeah. They've heard a lot of talk. They've always heard me talk with my sister in Montreal when we got together. We would talk about the funny things that we told the kids. We only told them the funny stuff about the war. They never knew until I, until I wrote the book what it really was. We used to ask you to take the book out. We saw that diary. It was in a, it was in a trunk, and we were always. It was a pretty velvet diary with a painting on it. We used to ask her just read it to us, and she'd always put it back and say no. No, I didn't want to talk. I didn't want to open it up. But they kept begging me, and I. So a couple of years. So then I finally translated it, and I have to say, I laughed in it, but I cried in it, and it was so emotional. It was like being back in the war time, you know, and my mother suffering and the child losing, and it was a lot. And then if they would come home and see me behind the computer, sad, you say, "Oh, mom, the war's over." <laughs> 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 you still say that. Yes. You say that all the time. Yes. Every time an airplane goes by, she. I like, still have it. Yeah. Every oh. like, mom, the war is over. And she won't throw away the garbage bags, you know, from the stores. <laughs> and we're like, mom, the war's over. Throw the garbage away. I still, we all have scars from that war, you know. And every time we hear a plane come over low, I look where I can hide, or I can duck. And, you know, they have to laugh about it, but it comes automatically. We all have things left over from the war, you know. Like I always think, oh, I can't throw away this food to people that have no food. It doesn't go away. I will always have it. And um, I spoke with this psychiatrist that had been dealing with people. As people got older, he told me a lot of them, they had a lot more problems about the past than when they had when they were young. It seems to come back. And he's dealing with, at the moment, with, in that town, the name we with 300 people that now get the problems as they get older. It seems to come, yeah. And there is nothing, he said, there is nothing that you can do. There's nothing. It doesn't go away. Don't you feel about talking about it that's helped you tremendously? Well, the, the book has helped me tremendously. It was very good therapy for me. I, I, somehow I got it out, the crying and the laughing and the, it came out, you know. But that was good therapy. And I, I suggest every young person, when they go through something or they go to Pakistan or whatever, whenever they come back from war, it would be very good if they were to write a diary. It would be really helpful. Because it, it, you, when you write it on paper, there's nobody laughing or saying, oh, forget it, don't it. You know, you're alone with the paper. You can be real to the paper. Because we grew up at that time, oh, don't feel sorry for yourself. If somebody lost somebody, oh, don't feel sorry for yourself. Because everybody said it to each other. Because everybody suffered, you know, everybody suffered. But, you know, we lived through it. And, and I tell my kids, don't feel sorry for yourself all the time. <laughs> oh, <laughs> yeah. And then when she just lost her house in Harvey, oh. the mom was like, oh, it's nothing. Oh. No, oh. Mom, you're still breathing. <laughs> <laughs> yeah. uh, when the gentleman was talking about eating the tulips, it reminded me of a story that I had. One of the things that you hear a lot is that Hitler wanted the pure race. Yes. Um, when they came into a country, as you mentioned, they took the men to send them to Germany to work so their, sol their men could be soldiers. And my father was captured, he was one of those. And um, they, he knew they were coming because they would come to places of business and take everybody, so he didn't shave and he was a pretty lousy not shaver, <laughs> looked pretty bad. But he put green salve in it, and so he flunked the physical. First time. <laughs> and the next time, of course, they got him. But he did escape, and wow. so that's that, that's what they did to ensure that you wouldn't contaminate the Germans when they took you over there. Yeah. And then they in Amsterdam they had like little foam booths mm -hmm. where they put the 
captives. And when wow. somebody got mad at you, then they line some of them up and shoot you yeah. dead. Yeah. yeah. And my mom used to put my brother on the bike and go down and visit him before he got on the train. But he didn't oh, get on the train. He escaped. But wow. that pure race thing is very real. Yeah. Wow. Mm -hmm. And this gentleman was it. Yeah. Yes, absolutely. Yeah. The German scientist. Yeah, the German scientist. Mama. Oh, I know this gentleman wants to ask a question, I think. Oh, you two, you two, you two together. You are together, you two. Yeah. Okay. Yeah. We, uh, this lady just mentioned about the German scientists that went to America. Yeah, they took all scientists also. To here. Yes, Werner von Braun. Yeah, yeah, we got the. Oh, yeah. I know, that, that that's really. Yes. Werner von Braun, of all things, he was number one criminal for the British people. <laughs> A whole lot of criminals. But it's hard to with the rocket science, you see. It depends on what they were studying. Mm -hmm. Some of the boys at my school got letters yeah. asking the kids to do more volunteer. And they were in medicine, chemistry, dental work. Mm -hmm. And they wanted them to stay in school just as long as they could before they knew it. Mm -hmm. Yeah. As a government volunteer, we'll call them. Well, it's kind of hard to do. Well, I don't know anyone else. <laughs> do you guys have enough of hearing about the war? <laughs> you can't write three books. <laughs> yeah, that's yes. awesome. Yeah. Yeah. But you have to. You have to remember, it's written by a teenager. You know, and like we did teenage things, like we would span a very thin wire from one side to the street to the other side. And we would hear these Germans coming with these, with these boots, you know. And then we, they had these nails under the boots. They had nails under these boots. And we were waiting, especially for a big shot. We didn't know what he was, but as long as he had a lot of stuff on his shoulders, we thought, oh, here's a big one. We get the big one. And then we hear them marching, and the march alone made us sick. And then when the big one in the front would come, we would push the wire just on, from one side to the next. And the guy would fall because the thin fire, the thing, the very thin wire would hook under the nails of these boots. And then we would laugh and laugh and laugh. And then. And another boy said he had found out this new secret weapon. And it was <laughs> simply, he knew this lady that used to have a big restaurant, and she had a collection of old bottles, beautiful Geneva, whiskey, whatever, beautiful bottles, wine bottles. So what they did was, in the rain pot, in the gutter, in the dirty gutter, and with all that war material falling in that gutter, you know, we were very polluted at the time from all that war material, falling in the, in the rain gutter. From that rainwater, they bottled it. They bottled that rainwater, and then they put a little touch of liquid in it, a little touch of alcohol. Okay. And then we had this lady with all her collection of fancy bottles, knew how to bottle them, and then they also know that the Germans were always looking for, on the black market, for booze. <laughs> <laughs> so they would go there and they would go and say, we have the snobs, snobs, if it's a snob. They would have it and ch they would get a lot of money from those Germans selling these bottles. <laughs> but then what happened was they would hide and just wait what happened. So then they, it was very dangerous, but we did dangerous things. So we were all waiting, and we were waiting for these Germans to come out of the vessel. Blind. They were blind. The stuff made them blind. It was bad stuff. It was too fresh. I don't know what it was. They made them blind, and they all yelled, we can't see, we can't see, you know. So we had to rush like crazy to get back home. <laughs> but then we had such a pleasure out of it. Because, <laughs> because they boys had the 
developed a secret weapon. <laughs> they said, you know, it doesn't cost anything, I think it doesn't cost anything, and it's the cheapest weapon they can make. <laughs> you don't need to be a scientist. <laughs> but you know, it was all that, 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 that sort of stuff went on. So it wasn't, we weren't all that, you know, we, we had to have something to be young. We taught each other how to dance, you know, and that was fun, and, and, and just tried to speak English to each other, which, <laughs> looking back, it was crazy, but we did. But it was nice. That part was nice, anyway. Well, I think I, if anyone, if no one else has a question, Thank you.